Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us so early in the morning for resuming our conference, Bush, the Legacy and Lessons, What Citizens and the Next President Need to Know. And I'm Gleaves Whitney, Director of the Hallenstein Center for Presidential Studies here at Grand Valley. I'm your host, and as host, uh, your host, I feel a little bit like the uh, body in an Irish wake. Uh, you have to have one, but you don't expect it to say much. <laughs> Now, uh, we have a number of distinguished people here, and I want to recognize them. This conference has been many, many months in the planning. We were able to assemble a very distinguished crew from around the country, and if you'll hold your applause until I get to the end of the list of people who are going to be participants. But just in alphabetical order, I'd like to go through them. Please stand as I call your name. John Burke, our keynoter this morning from the University of Vermont. Uh, Lou Fisher from the Library of Congress. Uh, Brian Flanagan from Grand Valley State University, uh, Dale Herspring from Kansas State, Thomas Keck from Syracuse, there, Mike Nelson from Rhodes, where's Mike? Oh, there you are, there's Mike, Casey Pipes, uh, author of Ike and a former Bush speechwriter, Mitch Sollenberger from George Mason University, uh, Chuck Wolcott from Virginia Polytechnic Institute, and myself. I'll be presenting a little bit later, too, but I'm already standing, so. Uh, let's give a hand to all of these folks. <laughs> really appreciate their being here for what I believe will be the first scholarly assessment of the Bush administration in our nation after the election, and the most comprehensive. There have been other attempts. In fact, the Hallenstein Center hosted an earlier scholarly assessment of the Bush administration back in 2003, but uh, we wanted to wait until after this election in which we'd know who Bush's successor was because I think that puts the Bush presidency in greater perspective. So we are very delighted to kick off day two of our conference after a, a very dynamic evening last night. Is Rufus Spears here? As Rufus made it this morning, he gave a uh, a very rousing keynote address last night. For those of you who were here know that it was uh, something that a lot of people uh, felt that there was much to think about after he spoke. Well, let's get started with our keynote speaker this morning. It is my honor and privilege to introduce John Burke. He specializes in American politics, the American presidency, and ethics and public affairs, so he is a perfect speaker for the Hallenstein Center. He has published numerous articles and eight books Currently at press is a new study of the President's National Security Advisor, Honest Broker, the National Security Advisor and Presidential Decision Making that Texas A&M Press will be coming out with. Another area of recent and ongoing research is presidential transitions in office. So obviously he has devoted considerable attention to what uh, the Barack people, who, as they transition from a campaign to actually governing, are going through. A number of books there. Uh, in addition, uh, he has one, I, one of his books, I mean, many distinguished books, but there's one in particular that I would like to um, mention. His book, How Presidents Test Reality, won the 1990 Richard Neustadt Award of the American Political Science Association for the best book on the American presidency. He has served on the editorial board of Public Administration Review and is a member of the executive committee of the Presidency Research Group of the American Political Science Association. And from 1991 to 1995, he was the chairman of the political science department at the University of Vermont. He received his bachelor's degree from Stanford and his MA and his PhD from Princeton. He's also Phi Beta Kappa. So he has a lot of smart things to say. John Burke, we welcome you. Just want to remind everyone to turn off their cell phones, please. Well, welcome. Um, first, let me thank Professor Gleaves Whitney for his kind introduction. And let me also thank the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies, its very competent staff, and Grand Valley State University for this invitation to address you. <laughs> It's indeed a pleasure to be with you this morning. How to understand and account for the presidency of George W. Bush and its evolution over time. This is not an easy task, 
and it's a premature one as well. Much still remains unknown about this presidency and its inner workings. Bob Woodward's best-selling books notwithstanding. Let us first, however, gently remind ourselves that any attempt to count for the Truman presidency at the end of 1952 would have been far different, far, far different from an account rendered some 40 years later, as David McCullough and others have reminded us. So too with Dwight D. Eisenhower. Contemporaneous assessments by Arthur Schlesinger Jr., Richard Neustadt, and others got it simply wrong. The pundit version circa 1960 of a genial but complacent, syntax challenged, golf playing Eisenhower was a far cry from a presidency that proved more intricate, strategic, and hidden hand in its inner, inner workings as Fred Greenstein and others, myself included, found once we began to delve into Eisenhower's presidential papers when they were opened decades later. So caution must be our guide. But that said, let's proceed on. There are a number of what might be termed lenses of analysis that are useful in making sense of the American presidency or the administration of a particular president. Many of the other presentations today will explore them, whether it is attention to the use of the cabinet and the organization of the White House staff, reliance on the bully pulpit, the politics of a foreign or a domestic policy agenda, the president's leadership style, or the administration's conception of its war powers and other constitutional prerogatives. Stephen Skoranek of Yale University has argued quite persuasively, I think, that the broader, what he terms, political time of a presidency matters in understanding its success or failure. In his view, the place of a presidency within a broader cycle of political regimes defines its challenges, sets forth its resources and opportunities, and establishes parameters for evaluating its performance. But this morning, I would like to focus on a different lens, an internal lens of analysis, one composed of three interrelated parts. The first is what might be termed the internal time of the Bush presidency. By that I mean the internal rhythms within a presidential administration that set down challenges and call for an effective response. As I and others have argued, for example, transitions to office can be highly consequential for new presidencies, not just in putting an administration in place, but in charting the course for its future success or sometimes failure. So too with electoral cycles within a presidency. First the consequences of the midterm congressional races, then the ramping up for re-election. For presidents who are successful at re-election, the prospect of a lame duck presidency looms. This might arise first in terms of the sixth year itch that often brings losses in congressional seats. It might then be compounded as the election of a successor approaches by a significant deflection away from the policy initiatives and actions of the incumbent administration. The second part of my analysis, my analytic lens, is crises. They too must be factored in. Sometimes they are of the administration's own making, and sometimes they are external in source. But they punctuate those internal rhythms, and they demand that the routine and the quotidian respond to the extraordinary. Third, internal, cri internal time and crisis call for response. Here we come to individual presidents and the deliberative apparatus that has been created. For this president, that clearly was significant in its own ways. 